Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. That by itself, that by itself, that verse by itself, if it could just rest and settle in our hearts today, no more crying, no more pain, no more sorrow. Well, as we look at this, I need to begin by, by pointing out a couple of things. One, chapter 21 uh, contains events that, that are chronologically following the judgment at what was referred to as the great white throne. The great white throne judgment is what was found in chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. This white throne judgment, this great white throne judgment, as we were together last time, I mentioned to you that I should give you a little bit more than I was able to give at the conclusion of our study. So I'll pick up with a few things in chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, and then move on into chapter 21 as it follows again chronologically in sequence. Because what you have in chapter 20, verses 11 through 15 of the book of Revelation is the final courtroom scene, if you will. You see, after these verses, in verses 11 through 15 of chapter 20, after these verses, uh, there will be no more judgment ever. The unsaved people, all of whom have ever lived, will be resurrected. And they are going to experience a uh, courtroom trial. Now, unlike today, there will be no debate as to whether they are guilty or as to whether they are innocent. Everyone who is there at the great white throne judgment is completely guilty. And another thing about it is the judge will show no leniency and he will show no sympathy and he will show no mercy. Now that's very important to understand. They aren't going to be there, in other words, who are standing before the, the judge. They are not going to be able to plead no contest. They're not going to plead guilty with an explanation. They're not going to be able to defend themselves at all. There is no leniency. There is no mercy. There is, isn't even sympathy. They are going to be receiving judgment. If anybody's in this room tonight who doesn't know Christ, anybody who doesn't know Christ, and you die without Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches you will stand before this judge. And this judge isn't going to think you're sweet or cute or that you made a mistake or that you were young, or that it just wasn't done right for you. He's not going to think any of that. You're not going to have any protesters, activists, marchers, signs, riots. None of that. None of that's allowed in this courtroom. None of that will take place. This will be a place of solemnity with the king, the judge, God himself, and you need to understand that. You need to see that. Because that's what's taking place at the great white throne judgment. God is the judge. And because God is righteous, God will judge righteously. He will do so impartially. He will do so fairly. 
in, in Psalm 96, verse 13, it says, He is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Psalm 98, verse 9, he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness, he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity, with fairness. In 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so there will be no appeal. There will be no retrial. This is the final judgment. Now, Satan has been very successful in convincing people that there will be no such thing as a final judgment. Satan has deceived the world into believing there's nothing to be concerned about. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You see, Ultimately, no one at the white throne judgment will have any grounds to complain. Not one is going to be able to stand up and say, you don't understand. Not one is going to be capable of saying, you're, you're not fair or you're not righteous. Any who would think that they could do that have an exaggerated sense of their own goodness and have reduced God from his greatness don't understand what righteousness is and don't understand what true justice is. So to try and argue that, well, that won't happen. If God were truly a loving God, he wouldn't do that, is to not understand who God is. The judgment is going to be righteous. It's going to be impartial because these people have been unrepentant. It's called the great white throne judgment because it is great because the throne is the greatest of all thrones. So it's a great white throne. The throne is the greatest of all thrones because it's the seat of God's rule. It is the white throne because white reveals purity. It reveals holiness. And it reveals the justice that is being dispensed. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, in chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, Daniel writes, I watched as thrones were put in place. And the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow. His hair like white as wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. And a river of fire flowed from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. And a hundred million stood to attend him. Then the court began its session. And the books were opened. So what you have here is an amazing picture of righteous judgment. And the dead, great and small, are standing before God as these books are opened. So all unbelievers who have ever lived are present, great and small, from the celebrities, you know, the great, to the petty gossips and liars and just ordinary sinners, from the great to the small, to, from those who are known for their immensity of evil, the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Maos and the Bin Ladens, these monsters from the great, from the ones who are well known for their evil, to the petty, to the people who really weren't known for much other than narcissism or that they loved to gossip or they were very selfish and the bible says the sea gives up the dead and death and hades and deliver and death and hades delivers up the dead in them so when it speaks of the sea the sea giving up the dead in verse 13 there are those who would say the sea could see, speak in a figurative sense of, of the sea of humanity and there's no reason why that couldn't be an accurate way to see that but also there are those who say the sea could also be a reference to a place where those who have died at sea, and think of some of the, the historical tragedies that we have from things like the sinking of the Titanic and the Lusitania and various others, um, you know, ships that have gone down and lost uh, many people, and, 
And, and usually uh, a picture of somebody lost at sea, because of the immensity of sea and uh, the depth of it at all, uh, that's usually a picture of something that is hopeless and whoever has been lost in sea will never be found again. And so there are those who would say that the sea could actually be speaking in a literal sense of the sea and all who were lost at sea or lost at any, in any body of water. And so it speaks, though, of these who are coming up. Death speaks, uh, it says, death in Hades delivers up the dead. Death is the temporary abode of the bodies, and Hades is the temporary abode of the soul. But both of them will be swallowed up in the permanence of the final judgment. And again in verse 13, they were judged, each one according to his works. Here's something for you. It's kind of serious, isn't it? We're going to get into some good news in a minute. I don't want to leave you in sin. I was speaking yesterday to a, a group of pastors and their wives. I was invited to speak at a, a pastor's conference, Calvary Chapel Pastors, in one of the counties. I was sharing with them how that, as pastors, we need to be careful because people sometimes will look at their pastor as if he's some form of celebrity. Begin to think that the pastor is the most perfect person in the church. I said, you have to be careful with that that kind of, of a sentiment because there are those who love you and, and they may make you feel very special, but you know, and I was sharing to the pastors and I speak to myself as I speak to them, I said, you know that if they could see what really is in your heart, what you really are, how much you really need the grace of God and the mercy of God, there would be no worship of the pastor in the church because that that pastor, we pastors, are supposed to be the chief servants in the church, not the celebrities in the church, not the special individuals in the church. We're just a member of the church. We have different gifts and callings, different responsibilities, and we receive stricter judgment, greater stricter judgment, because we handle the word of God. And if I cause one of these little ones who believe in Jesus Christ to stumble, that's a great offense to the Lord. And a man can sin very easily with his tongue. He has to be very careful what he presents to be true or not true. And ultimately what happens, I have to give an account. And I was sharing with them and I said, listen, if they could read our thoughts or even know the thoughts that we could be having even in a day, even in a single day. I said, think about some of the things that you thought about today. The things that enter your heart or memories that you have. Things you remember doing. And first thing in the morning, you might be reminded of something evil that you did. And that may stay with you the whole day. And, and it's there. And it's not that you're held guilty for it, but you have remembered it. Or there are things that go on. And I was sharing with them that way. Because, listen, every thought, this is so heavy. Judgment. Every thought, every word, and every deed. Every thought, word, and deed comes up before the Lord. How could I be not guilty without Jesus? How could I be not guilty without Jesus? There are those who believe that God is going to judge on some kind of scale. My good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. That can never happen. My thoughts are taken into account. My words are taken into account, and not just my actions. Even the secret things, even the secret things. Psalm 90, verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Our secret sins. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil. Now, isn't that nice? Thank God. Well, that's just true. Got to tell you the truth, right? Thank God for the blood of Christ. Thank God for the blood of Christ that washes us clean from all sin. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. No, from all unrighteousness it's the blood it's the blood of Christ because that cleanses me 
from all these sins. That's why I rejoice in the grace of God, because I need his mercy. That's why. It's just a fact. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, according to verses 14 and 15, ultimately, all will enter the lake of fire. They will be banished forever in unending sorrow. Now, again, in verse 11 of chapter 20, I'll use that as my introduction into chapter 21 now. In verse 11, remember it says, the earth and heaven fled away. And what we have is a new heaven, verse 21, and a new earth. So the term a new heaven is in reference to the creation of a new universe. And that's what we see in chapter 21. I saw, verse 1, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So this universe as we now know it, will be destroyed. An entirely new creation will exist. That is the witness in both Old and New Testaments. Isaiah 65, 17, Old Testament. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. The day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. Everything in them will disappear in fire. The earth and everything on it will be exposed to judgment. Since everything around us is going to melt away, what holy, godly lives you should be living you should look forward to that day. Hurry it along. The day when God will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world where everyone is right with God. So the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, that will occur after the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ, and the white throne judgment. Now, notice there was no more sea. Three quarters of the earth presently is made up of bodies of water. And our lives depend on water. Uh, our blood is some 90% water. Even our physical flesh is 65% water. So we need water in these physical bodies. But when we have our new bodies, our bodies that have been made to exist in eternity, we don't need the blood because, because what we have is a spiritual life now. So the life is no longer in, in the blood. The life of the flesh is no longer in the blood. We have spiritual life because we've received glorified bodies. And so heaven is going to have a different approach or the universe is going to be different and heaven will have a different uh, there will be no more bodies, main bodies of water. There is a, a river, by the way, mentioned, and we'll see that next time we're together in chapter 22. It's, called, uh, it, it's one that has what is called the water of life. But outside of that mentioning in chapter 22, it appears that there's no other bodies of water. And so in verse 2, John continues, and he says, I saw, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, this holy city, New Jerusalem, is the capital city, uh, is what has been called the capital city of the eternal state. It is heaven's capital city, is what he's speaking about. It's this new Jerusalem. Now, why would there need to be this new city? John saw this holy city, New Jerusalem. Why would there need to be a new one? Well, during the tribulation, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem on earth, was spiritually polluted. Remember in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8, how, how it says there, their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So Jerusalem is going to have this reputation of being polluted. And so there's going to be of necessity a new city. So it's New Jerusalem. Now notice again in verse 2, New Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven from God. Now she is not mentioned as having just been created. It would seem that New Jerusalem exists all along. In John 14, Jesus makes reference in this way. 
verses 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus has already made reference to this, and it's undoubted that she has existed through the millennial reign. But she, right now, is presently separated from the existing universe because of sin. When the new heaven and earth is created, then she's going to descend into a perfect universe. And New Jerusalem will serve as the dwelling place of all the redeemed. It's coming down out of heaven is a way for us to know that it has an existence already, a previous existence. Now, in verse 2, I want you to notice something else. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I am certain we have a number of, of ladies here who are married, who have been married. I don't know if you're anything like most every woman I've ever met or known, but one of the most important days of your life, it's your wedding day. One of the most important days of your life is your wedding day. This one lady once said there are two very important days in your life. She said her wedding day and her burial day. Interesting. But your wedding day? I don't know. I don't know. I've never really asked this for you ladies who got married. Was it exciting? Was it? I don't know. Was it? See, see, you buy a dress. We rent a tux. That tells you something. <laughs> we rent the suit. I, know, I could go on about that. I, I'm not going to. I can roll with that one. But you get a nice dress. You know, the other day, the other day, Marie said, she said that she was looking at her dress, her wedding dress. I didn't know, even know she still had it. But she does. Just in case, I guess I'd die. She... <laughs> Dresses are beautiful, aren't they? They're special, aren't they? They cost a whole lot of money, don't they? They do. And that bride spends an awful lot of time getting ready for her moment that she appears to her husband for the first time. Done a few weddings, and I can tell you that um, when you go into the bride's room and you see that little bride, she's radiant. She is beautiful. She is so ready. I've, I've done quite a number of weddings. I was going to say funerals, but. <laughs> and that little girl is so ready, so calm most of the time, most of the time. I've only seen one in tears, but that's because her mother and soon-to-be mother-in-law were stressing her so badly, she started crying. And I walked in, and I saw this mother on one side and the other gargoyle on the other. <laughs> and she was crying. She was so upset. They were yelling and getting all weird. And, and I saw her, and I said to the mamas, I said, you need to leave the room. Well, you need to leave the room. You need to leave now. And they did. And I sat her, and I said, baby, you're going to be okay. Don't let anything take the joy out of your heart on this day, your wedding day. It's a beautiful day. Get back into the spirit of joy, and don't allow that to happen. Listen, when... A bride makes herself ready. It's a very special moment. And she's prepared for her husband. My wife, when she got married, I have one picture that I, I carry. And I just, a month ago, made a mistake of washing my clothes with my wallet in my pants. I'm a money launderer, I guess. But 
that picture was in my wallet. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I didn't realize it, and I found the wallet in, oh my goodness, so I took it out, and, the, and it's, a, it's an old picture, and so it was split, and, and so I, have, I don't carry it anymore. I'm going to have to try and get it fixed, you know, get it and all, but that's the one picture I carry. That's the one picture of Marie that I carry. It was when she stepped out, and I had my first glimpse of her when she walked out of the door and she stood there. And I tell every time I do a, a wedding for the young men, I say, when your bride, when they swing those doors open in the back, I said, and everybody stands to greet her, I said, look at her, look at her, because that is going to be one of the most beautiful moments that you will have in your heart for the rest of your life. And I have a picture of my son Joseph when he was getting married to Karina, his beautiful little bride. And the camera happened to catch his eyes with the tears that were starting to come down. The most beautiful moment when you see your bride and she has made herself ready. You know, they don't come out with banana peels in their veil and, you know, and one tennis shoe and one combat boot. I mean, they come out nice. They look good. They prepared themselves. And that's what it's supposed to be like, you see? And so, as this happened, again, in verse 2, she's adorned for her husband. The whole city, occupied by all saints of all generations, is described as this bride. John Walbert, a very, very fine Bible expositor, said, what we have here is not the church per se, but a city or dwelling place having the freshness and beauty of a bride adorned for marriage to her husband. Another commentator said, every child of God through all the ages whose earthly tabernacle has been dissolved shall be at this time in his heavenly house and thus together will form this heavenly city. It says in verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God is now dwelling among men in the new earth and the new Jerusalem. He is now with them, and as we used to say, they are his, and he is their, theirs. In Job 19, this is a beautiful scripture, Job 19, 26 and 27, he said, after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And then this beautiful promise, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The saints suffered as they followed their God. Many had pain, and many had sorrow in their lives. And as a loving, compassionate, tender father, God is pictured as wiping away every single tear. Any father in this room understands that. Any grandfather can understand that. As a father, there have been times when my babies were crying and they were hurt about something. And I would sit next to them and the little tears would be coming down their eyes. And I would put my hand on the cheek. And I'd wipe away their tears. My grandson, just a couple days ago, my Josiah, was hurt about something. He got hurt. His heart was hurt. And I sat with him. And he cried. And I sat. And I talked to him. And I loved him. And I wiped his tears. I understand the sentiment of this scripture. I understand it. And my God 
will do that for us. My God will wipe away every tear. No more crying. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more sickness. No more disappointment. Nothing like that. It's not welcome in heaven. It's not allowed in there. It won't be there. Do you look forward to that? Oh, I do. Oh, I do. Not as a, oh, I need to escape this ugly place. Listen, <laughs> we're, we're militant Christians. We're in a battle. I'm good with that. Let's win this world for Jesus Christ. But one of these days, one of these days, when we see our Lord, can you imagine? Please try. Can you imagine? Your God will wipe away every tear, every hurt. No more sickness. No more crippling diseases. No more babies dying. No more burying your grandmas, your grandpa. No more burying your daddy, your mama. No more loss. Listen, this is one of these scriptures in my life that I really embrace. I really do. I hope you do too. Because it makes it all worth it. It makes it all worth it. And my God will do that. My God is compassionate. Our God is tender. And as a compassionate father, he wipes away every single tear. Again, there are no regrets. There's no remorse. There's no sorrow. There's no more marriage and family pain. No more divorces. No more financial struggle. No more emotional hurts or sad memories. No more cancer, strokes, accidents. No more funerals. None of that. And God is aware of this. One of the real sweet, beautiful scriptures uh, that I, I, I love is Psalm 6, 56, 8, where he, the psalmist said, you number my wanderings. Then he said, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? God, don't forget. Don't forget. And so I, I'm telling you, man, this scripture here, God will wipe away every tear. None of that is welcome there where it's all swallowed up with eternity and joy. It says in verse 5, he sat on the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of, of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. He shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, when it says in verse 5, he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Um, when he says that, it's not saying I'm going to restore everything or rebuild. He says, I'm going to make this new, and it's going to be new in character as well as the sense of that which has recently been made. And so there's an incredible, drastic change from the way things used to be. It's so incredible that John has to be commanded to write. And then in verse 6, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. In the alphabet, we're able to store and communicate knowledge. To arrange them properly is to communicate all knowledge and so Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He is the supreme and sovereign alphabet, is what he's saying. Because within him are all the treasures of knowledge. Within Jesus is all knowledge. It's like what it says in Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3. My purpose is that they may be encouraged and heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is the Alpha and the Omega, 
the beginning and the end, the first letter of the alphabet as well as the last letter, and any word that communicates the righteousness and goodness of God is found in him. He is that. He's the summation of that and the origin of that. He says, I will give up the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. So here's a phrase for you that I like. Heaven belongs to the thirsty. Speaking of thirsty, excuse me. It belongs to those who have a need of spiritual quenching. Do you remember, remember in John 4, 13 and 14, Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, when you got saved, when you gave your heart to Christ, when Jesus became your Lord and your Savior, when he washed you, cleansed you of all your sin, when he filled you with his Holy Spirit, when he awakened you to the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, when you began to hear the promises that he was going to return and take you to be with him, that where he is, there you will be also. When you started embracing those things and you started seeing those things, did you say to yourself, I wonder what Buddha has to say? What's Muhammad got to say on the subject? No, Jesus is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. He gives living water. And the others can't. They can't give me life. You see, Buddha and Muhammad are dead. But Jesus is alive. And so Jesus is able to give me that which he possesses. In him is life, John said. And this life is the light of men. So Jesus Christ gives us life, you see. And he gives us this water to drink. But if you're thirsty, you come to the water. And so when I came to him, I, my thirst was quenched. It says in verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. I'll be his God, he shall be my son. So the one who overcomes is the one who has exercised saving faith in Jesus. And that one inherits everything. But, now notice verse 8. Cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters. These are the, what is called the principal characteristics of an unsaved person. What's interesting is how he began when he refers to the cowardly. Now, why would he refer to the cowardly in a list of all of these things? Because that could be referring to the fact that this person refused to acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. There are those, and you have probably met them. You may know one or two, maybe more, who have been afraid to acknowledge Jesus in front of friends and family. They don't want to confess him before man, kind of keep it to themselves. Well, that's an interesting thing because he's saying the cowardly refuse to acknowledge who Jesus is. And Jesus made a strong statement once. He said, he said if you confess me before men, I also will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I also will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. So there's an acknowledgement, a confession, a reception, a belief, an openness. If there was anything that is the earmark of the um, Jesus movement, anything, there are several things that are earmarks, but one of them is we were very open with our faith. We didn't hide it under a bushel. We spoke about it openly. And that way we were able to win our parents to Christ, my family to Christ, my friends to Christ, because we were taught, share it. You see, I learned a long time ago that the most selfish person on earth is the one who goes to heaven alone. What we do is we share our faith and we openly acknowledge Jesus Christ. And when he's speaking of these other things, unbelieving, etc., no genuine Christian can uh, be categorized by those sins. Now, in verses 9 and 10, continuing, and you're thinking, are you going to make it to verse 27? Yes. Um, I'll do my best. One of the seven angels who had with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. 
And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And so John sees the beautiful city, and he sees it as gorgeous as the most beautiful bride. In verse 11, having the glory of God, and her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, as clear as crystal. And so he gives a general description of its beauty and its character. It's characterized as having the glory of God. And, and he begins to share something else. Notice, he says in verse 12, uh, she had great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates, names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. On them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. He who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its, its length, breadth, and height are equal. He measured its wall, 150. 44 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. The street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall be shut, shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, but... There shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Interestingly, the stones pictured here are beautiful, and we'll look at them briefly, of course. But here's the key for you. They don't produce the light. They only reflect it. I always keep that in mind because when the scripture says let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and, and glorify your father who is in heaven Matthew 5 16 when when the scripture speaks about our light shining and all of that remember it's a reflected light that that light doesn't originate with you you can go to a jewelry store I've been taken captive to one or two in my time and uh and you know what the jeweler would do. They normally will take whatever the, uh, the diamond, if you will, and they'll put it on a black or a dark velvet, and they put it there on that for you. Then sometimes they'll shine a light on it. Why? Why do they do that? For contrast and because it doesn't produce its own internal light. It only reflects it. And so, so that's what you and I do. We only reflect the light of God. We don't generate it because the true light is Jesus himself. We need to keep that in mind. Because sometimes we try to be Jesus ourselves, and in fact, we're not. We're, we're like the moon, and he's the sun, and we simply reflect what he is. That's how that works. And, and it comes from within because he generates it from within by the power of his Holy Spirit. But as we look at that, Jesus being the light, um, we need to remember, according to verse 23, really, the precious stones simply reflect his glory. Now, I'll give you very briefly, and you'll be surprised at how quickly I can do this because it really won't take that much time. I'm just going to give you some basic information. What we have here... 
in verses 12 through 14 is a great high wall. That, that wall, somebody says, why is heaven a gated community? <laughs> well, it, it, it is really a picture of exclusion. It, it, it speaks concerning uh, how that, that, that we have entered in under the protective interest of God and that you have to have a relationship with the Lord to even be there. It, it speaks of 12 gates and 12 angels. It, it could be a picture of an honor guard, if you will. It, it also reveals to us uh, the nation of Israel, but it also contains uh, representation of the church. In verses 15 through 17, it, it speaks concerning the measurements. And, and the measurements, as I was looking at this, and I'll be honest with you, I won't go into great detail with you about this, but there are different figures that some have given from, from anywhere from 1,500 miles in terms of measurement to 1,377 miles. Uh, it just depends on what you consider a stadia or a furlong to be. Some consider a furlong to be 600 feet, others 608 feet, and it can get kind of complicated. So I've, I've basically gone with the distance being around 1,377 miles, and the walls are either being described as of their thickness or their height. If it's describing their height, their height of the walls that are spoken of here, 216 feet. If it's speaking concerning the thickness, that's 216 feet thick. But it doesn't say whether it's the height or the thickness. It simply is just describing the immensity of it. It's more than likely, it looks like it's in a cubic form, in a cube form, because it states its length, its breadth, and its height, and it's all equal. There are no details other than it's the place of the redeemed, all the redeemed throughout all the ages, and that's where we're going to live. It descends from heaven. It more than likely rests on earth, but again, that's not even clearly stated. In verses 18 through 21, it speaks concerning the 12 stones, the jasper. That's a completely clear diamond-like stone. A sapphire, it's like a diamond, yet it's blue. Chalcedony is an agate, sky blue with stripes and other colors. The emerald is green. Sardonyx is red and white. Sardius is, it's an orange or a red quartz. A chrysolite is a transparent gold or yellow. Beryl is greenish yellow or blue. Topaz is yellow green and it's transparent. Chrysop chrysoprase is another shade of green, kind of like an apple, but I, you know, if you don't know what color apple I'm talking about, it's green. Uh, <laughs> Jathins is, is red, violet, maybe even a shining blue, and amethyst is a clear quartz crystal. And the colors range from purple, a light purple, to a very intense purple. What you have here, though, is just a simple picture of, that is overwhelming in, in beauty. That's what you have here. It's overwhelming in its beauty. And the walls have gates of a huge pearl, and the streets are pure gold and transparent. That should help me next time I get all weird about gold. Because God says, you know, yeah, gold, that's cool. I use it for pavement. <laughs> now, we'll close. Verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. No longer is there a structure necessary, because the true temple is with his people. And believers now have access to sacred fellowship with God. Verses 23 and 24, the city has no need of sun or the moon to shine. The glory of God illumines it. God is the source of light in this city. God is light, the scripture says, in him there is no darkness at all. And Jesus speaks of himself as the light of the world, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And one last thing, and then we'll close. Verse 27, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles, causes abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. I, I want everybody, I would love everybody to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I, I, I would love every one of my relatives and friends and neighbors and all, I would love them to be able to be there with us, guys. 
Um, realistically speaking, I know that not everybody will. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk to them, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't seek the Lord for opportunity to share the gospel, share our testimony, invite them to church. One last thought, and then we'll close with prayer. You may have somebody in your life that you think, or somebody you know that you think, is so far gone that they can't get saved. I was at a Christian concert. I was 23 years old. Seated in front of me at this Christian concert was a motorcycle gangster. He was, uh, I, he was about 6'4", six, six probably 280 pounds. His arms were as big as hams. I remember that. And he was wearing his colors, and the sleeves were cut, so his hairy back and arms were hanging out. Big old sausages. <laughs> and he was so big, and I'm not exaggerating. I really couldn't see the stage. He was so big. I was trying to look around him, and his hair was real long and bushy. But I didn't tell him anything. <laughs> I just listened. But I kept looking at this guy. I remember I just, I just kept looking at him. And then here comes this guy. He, he was a lead singer and preacher from a group called JC and the Power Outlet. They were a hard rock Christian band. JC and the Power Company. And, uh, and this guy, he, he, he got up there and he started preaching with all the confidence and all the certainty and he's just a young guy. And he's starting to give an invitation. And I was leaning back looking at the Hulk. And, and, I, and I said, this guy can't get saved. He is beyond salvation. I remember thinking that. He's beyond salvation. When all of a sudden he stands up at the invitation. Now, I think he's mad. I think he's going to walk out. I don't know what he's doing. But I remember distinctly his big old arms as he started wiping tears out of his eyes. He was wiping his eyes like this. And he stumbled out of the, out of the pews, out of the chairs. And he walked up and he stood in the front. He was in the center. He was the whole front row. <laughs> and I, I'm, not, I'm not teasing And when I say this. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, and I've never forgotten this. He said this, I can save anyone. I've never forgotten that. I can save anyone. Can he? Did he save you? He can save anyone.